Coming up on episode 22 of the Art Podcast, we have a conversation with my colleague Will Landau on his new package Drake to enhance your R workflow. We also have a jam packed community roundup, listener feedback, and a couple package picks to round things off. So, without further ado, I only have one question Are you ready? Hi everyone, welcome back to the R Podcast. I am your host Eric Nance, and I'm pleased to have you listening on your favorite podcasting device or whatever else you choose to listen with. So, hope you enjoy it. And um, if you're new to the show, I definitely invite you to check out the backlog. We've had a lot of great content, especially recently with some of the interviews I've been able, been uh, kind, been lucky enough to to have, and so. We've had a lot of good feedback from that. Um, we have another great interview for this episode, so definitely stick around. Um, just want to mention that as I'm recording this, we can sense that spring is just around the corner in this part of the country. Still uh, fighting through some last bit of winter, but as it warms up, it just always makes me feel a little more cheery, a little more happy. I don't know if I have one of those like SAD disorders or whatever. I've never been diagnosed with it, but I'm always just not quite as uh, perky in the winter time. So it's good to see the sun a little bit more and get some warmer temperatures. So before we dive in the rest of the episode, I'll share a bit of a funny story, at least how my perspective has changed on something. So um, recently I took my uh, son to one of these um, kind of Lego land type uh, get togethers that we had locally. I think it only happens once a year. And so of course, like any kid, he's playing with Legos and learning how to build things or more more recently how to break things with them. That's a different story. Um, so we get to this place and it's just filling this convention center with every big creation of Legos you can imagine. You see everything from like Star Wars themes to you know building miniature cities and just it's amazing what people can do with Legos. It brings back memories when I was a kid trying to build all these. Although, if I didn't have an instruction manual of how to put all the pieces together, I would be kind of uh, scratching my head how to do it. Um, but as I'm going through this place and seeing how interested my son was in all this stuff, of course, I couldn't leave without buying one of these sets. Um, won't say how much it costs. That's another different story. Um, but they had a couple places where, of course, you can just build stuff yourself and have fun with it. And as he's building kind of what he calls these train tracks, <laughs> loosely defined there, um, I have one idea that's popping into my head, and I'm going to give uh, Jenny Bryan the credit for this, is that you may have seen in some of the recent presentations about things like the tidyverse or using you know list columns in your data frames that things like, you know, the Tidyverse is made popular now. You know, some of Jenny's greatest presentations recently have had awesome illustrations via Legos and how lists can really belong in a data frame, but then within the list, you kind of have your free reign of whatever types of objects you want. And the way she was illustrating that is, of course, through Legos. So this is the first time that I was surrounded by Legos and I'm immediately thinking, gee, I wonder if I can enhance some of my presentations about R with Legos, and I wonder if I can make connections with things like Shiny or anything like that. So, so Jenny, um, thank you for broadening my perspectives and <laughs> trying to figure out how Legos can help uh, illustrate some what can be very difficult concepts and things like R and the data frame structure and list structures. So again, I just never look at Legos the same way now. So that, that's a good thing, I think. Um, so anyway, just wanted to share a little bit about that. Um, but in terms of uh, setting up our, our talk, our interview for this episode, I'll share a little backstory on how I uh, met Will. 
So it happened about last summer or maybe last fall. I forget the exact time. Well, like any company, we're bringing in, you know, new candidates to potentially hire to help out with our, our functions. And I got an email from a colleague saying that he couldn't make it to one of a meeting with a candidate that was coming for an on-site visit. And could I help sub for him? And I'm like, oh, of course, I'm sure I'd be glad to. I was like talking to the new candidates and kind of seeing what their experiences are and where, where their um, where their strengths are. and. So I didn't know I didn't know Will before this, but then when he came to that on-site visit, it was easily kind of the fastest time I've had in terms of talking to somebody because the time just flew by. Um, he's uh, you'll you'll find out in the in the interview. He's a very passionate R user, has a lot of awesome ideas. We really hit it off. I you know tried to sell you know what opportunities we have in, in my company and. And sure enough, he uh, graciously accepted to join us. And in an even funnier twist, right about the time that he joined, I was uh, had a slight pivot in terms of my role in the company. And he actually ended up inheriting a lot of my older uh, projects. And, and with that, a lot of the R code I had built. And some of it messy, some of it pretty decent, depending on which project it was. But he quickly got up to speed, made things a lot faster, actually using the tool that you'll be hearing about today. Um, so with that little setup, I think it's why not? Let's just dive into my interview with uh, Will Landau. Welcome back, everybody, to the R Podcast. And for this uh, discussion, I am very uh, honored and pleased to be joined by one of my newer colleagues at work, who is also a very passionate R user and has recently made a, a very uh, interesting innovation in the realm of reproducibi reproducibility in the sense for the analysts themselves. He has made an awesome new package called Drake that you'll be hearing about from the source himself. So I want to welcome uh, Will Landau to the R Podcast. So Will, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Eric. The honor is really mine. I've, I've heard um, you know, you had, you've had Hadley and Yihue and, and Dirk on here. So, I mean, I am the one who is honored to be here. Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're too kind, sir. Yeah. For them, I just was a bug in their ears and they finally said yes. But uh, <laughs> you've, been, you've been very gracious to accept this um, chance to talk with me. So um, why don't you tell our listeners who may have not heard about you before um, how you got started using R? It was a rough start. I was in undergrad. I had a sort of decent Python and C++ background. And then in my fourth year, I walked into an intro stat class. And this may sound a little harsh. It was a little gentler at the time, but to paraphrase, my professor said something like, you guys are going to use R for your homework. We're not going to go over it in class because we don't have time, but you know, here's a cheat sheet. Here are some links. Go learn it. Wow. And I did my best. And I spent most of undergrad trying to hammer nails with the washing machine. I would do my own matrix multiplications instead of using the LM function, for example. I didn't know what was strong and what was weak in R. And you know, I still have fun because I like code. But when I got to grad school, I finally had a class that was statistical software focused, where we went through R from the ground up really systematically. And I felt after that, oh, OK, I understand what this is for. Mm -hmm. And that really helped and it started to be fun. So R is an acquired taste, but now it's it's one I once I have acquired it, it's very tasty. Very much so. So remind our listeners, um, where did you go to graduate school? I went to Iowa State. Very I was good. really lucky to be there when Gihue was there and when Dai Cook was there. And it was a hotbed for new developments in R and the tidyverse. I was really lucky to be there when I did, when I was. Nice. Yeah, obviously, yeah, we've had an excellent turnout of our users from there and yes. our developers. Yep, yep. I mean, I've watched what Carson Sievert's done with with Plotly. He was in my my cohort, and it's it is amazing. Yep, one of uh, one of my favorite new packages to look at from visualization, and um, I can't speak highly enough to how since I started learning R how different and frankly how much better those suites of packages are for creating visualizations about much code at all right. but now the interactivity of it 
um, listeners of the show know how fond I am of Shiny and our markdown with HTML that is becoming a, a really nice trend in, in our uh, community. We'll probably touch on that ourselves a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, um, can you tell me a bit about how R was used in any of your graduate research or your thesis to, to graduate at all? So in my thesis, my group and I developed a method for analyzing genomic data. It was it's not a really new method. It's, it's sort of a, a conglomeration of things that already exist. Sort of it was, it was um, the first time that our research group applied this one fully Bayesian method to this specific genomics problem. And it was driven by Markov Chain Monte Carlo, and it was really computationally intensive. So I wrapped it up in an R package or a series of R packages. Mm -hmm. And those had parallel backends driven by, well, one of them was a backend driven by graphics processing units or GPUs to use in, used in the scientific sense of taking advantage of parallelism with the CUDA architecture okay. to get um, tens of thousands of simultaneous tasks or threads going at once, because that's the sort of thing that we needed to do in, to implement this very high dimensional MCMC. Nice, nice. And well, how difficult was it to make a package that ties into these, you know, high performance computing architectures, like you said, uh, graphical computing and CUDA? How, how difficult is it to make one of those? So there were a lot of things that, a lot of different approaches I tried that were so close yet so far mm -hmm. in terms of getting things that already existed to play nicely with each other. Mm -hmm. At the time, and Dirk told me to stay tuned on this because it might be fixed. But at the time, I tried to sort of get RCPP to play nicely with CUDA in the, sort of the specific context that I wanted it to operate. And that didn't quite work out exactly the way I wanted to. So I just went into the sort of lower level R internals, which worked great for sort of passing data from R into C, passing data from C to the GPU or graphics processing unit and its memory system, and that worked out fine. It did take a lot of work trying to figure out not only how to do it, but how to do it cleanly. Hmm. And the R package stuff on its own was ended up being, at the time for me, really straightforward to learn and, and sort of great for things like quality control and organization, which is yes. something I still rely on packages for. Yes, absolutely. Was this around a time when DevTools is out or did you use um, just the typical like package skeleton framework stuff? I used the typical package skeleton framework okay. and I also organized my thesis work at the time in a package skeleton framework. Hmm. And that was helpful for, for sort of quality controlling things. I feel like I should have used DevTools more. I'm heavily reliant on it now, but I, I was sort of resistant just in, in my own inertia, being distracted by the content of the thesis to sort of well, learn these tools. It's kind of understandably distracted by that because you, <laughs> right. you only have so much of your effort to concentrate on you know, improving the tooling versus you've got a, a thesis to write and actually graduate. So. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I was focused on this one big thing and yep. it was hard to break my attention away for things that weren't directly in front of me, Yeah, unfortunately. Now I feel like I've had more time to branch out, which is really nice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yep, exactly. So yeah, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is you just released a, a very powerful package um, called Drake. And I want to you know, let you uh, take this time to tell the listeners what was your motivation for Drake and a little bit of high level what it's all about. Thanks, Eric. So. I, it's a bit of a long story. We got all I, so, the time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so I was talking with my advisor through this, this whole process of writing code for my thesis. And uh, several months to a year ago, you know, I told him how I was running and rerunning things and, you know, having to you know, change something in either in my package or in the code for the simulation studies I was doing. And then I had to wait days and days, really a couple of weeks for everything to run from start to finish all over again. And he should, he said that, you know, repeatedly to me, like he has done for several tools that I'm using now, 
um, you should be using make. You should be writing a make file to organize your workflow step by step. And then when you run that make file, then only the things that need to be rerun plus everything downstream is rerun. Mm -hmm. And the parts of the, the study that are unchanged are left alone. And that saves time. And a make file is a plain text file, right? The make file is a plain text file. It's okay. a configuration file. And it's an outline for a workflow. It says, this is an intermediate step, which depends on these things. And here's another intermediate step, which depends on a couple more things, mm -hmm. and so on. And it outlines all of these steps in any order possible, in any order you want. And what the program make does is it takes this make file and it generates a graph with nodes and edges outlining the tree structure of your project. Mm -hmm. And it goes through your project and sees what needs to be updated and then updates those things. And then it travels along that tree and updates everything that depended on what was previously built. I see, I see. And what's interesting is depending on what background you come from, if you come from more of like a software development background, you may be familiar with make files already, especially like on the Linux side, you can often compile programs from source and the tarball source file has a make file in it. And when I was first using Linux, I had no earthly idea what this was for. I just knew I had to use it somehow and then it would magically install the program. But this is actually not just for software development, it's for any kind of workflow. Like you said, it has dependencies that you can intelligently determine if they need to be rerun or not. So, exactly. Very interesting. Yep. Exactly. It is an underutilized tool. It was developed in the 70s by programmers who wanted to compile, say, C and Fortran programs mm -hmm. because there were multiple components of those programs. And you could sort of compile each component and then link them together later. And to split that up was useful for their work. But it's useful right, for any kind of scientific or data-driven work because it can be divided into intermediate steps. Yep, very good. So then how does Drake fit in, in kind of wrapping that concept of a make file? So Drake does the same thing, but it's R-focused. Before I talk about this, I should, I should acknowledge, do my dil due diligence to acknowledge another package called Remake, which, which really paved the way for Drake. Okay. So Remake, as I was, so my advisor, Jared Nemi from Iowa State, who's still there and he's uh, doing exciting work, especially in Bayesian computation. Um, he mentioned to me that, you know, I should be using make files and I should sort of, and he was working on his own sort of way to, to make a template for graduate students to ha ameliorate simulation study work for, you know, future students who would who would come in and start working for him so um i was looking for you know around the web to see you know does something already exist because i thought you know there must be an r package that does that and sure enough i found on github this package called remake yeah. which is sort of an r version of make files mm -hmm. so it, it looks at a configuration file it's a different kind of configuration file than a make file and it in this in this configuration file is sort of a bunch of R commands and a bunch of variables in R that you assign with those commands. Mm -hmm. And it looks at the graph, the, the tree of your workflow, and it sort of it does things that make does, except well better really. It focuses on there's I'm wondering how much into the details I should dive, but let's as say much as you want. Yep. Let's just say that it has a more intelligent mechanism to recognize when something is truly up to date and when something truly needs to be rerun. Okay. And it's and it's super convenient because those objects that it generates aren't external files like in make with make files. You have a bunch of cached objects that you can load into a session. Right, right. And so remake really paved the way for an R focused reproducible build system. Now Drake came about starting in the summer when I when I started using Remake and I said, well, you know, it'd be nice if this had some parallel computing. 
Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a couple of sidekick packages for, for Remake, one which sort of added some parallel computing and another added sort of this, this interface around Remake that made simulation studies easier. But I ended up sort of wanting more from Remake. And there were some, there were some things that I, you know, some incremental improvements that I wanted to see for Remake. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to have my sort of sidekick packages that I wrote on top of it sort of be its own thing. So I branched off okay. and I wrote Drake. And Drake stands for, um, and this is when I sort of officially start talking about Drake yes. now that I've done my, my due diligence to yes. acknowledge here. Yes. So Drake stands for Data Frames in R for Make. And it's, it is a workflow manager like Remake. It is R focused like Remake. It's um, what you do to use it is you organize your workflow in a data frame. And in your data frame, you have the names of intermediate targets in your workflow, things like external files or objects in R that you want to generate. And next to each target, you have a command that actually outputs the thing. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you put that data frame into, into Drake, you have objects in your workspace that Drake imports, it sort of automatically recognizes what packages you have loaded, what functions you've defined, et cetera. And it brings all that in as well. Nice. And it brings in functions that you reference in those functions as well. And reproducibly tracks those, whether they, whether they come from packages or, or in the base environment or, or global environment or whatever. And what Drake does is it, it makes a dependency graph, that tree, just like make, it holds onto that graph. You can even visualize it. You can even plot it if you want to. Nice. And um, you can make either part or all of your workflow. And when something is out of date, when you change a function in your code, when you change a command to generate a target, or even if you break uh, an intermediate file that you write, or you change a file that Drake imports to make other things, the correct results will be recomputed. The ones that are already up to date are skipped. Nice. Nice. So it's really helping you, the an analysis developer, of reducing this unnecessary rework, but being intelligent enough to know that, hey, wait a sec, I changed this data source, or I changed you know, the way I'm running this function, maybe this linear model or something, and it's going to rerun all that for you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly what it does. And the benefit, I think, here, the main benefits are twofold. One, you save time. You know, in usual data analysis environments, data analysis is inherently iterative. Everyone says that. Mm -hmm. You run something, then you realize, hey, these results don't make sense. Do I have a bug in my code? Oh, there's the bug. I go back and change that, rerun the analysis, bring the results to the team. The team says, oh, did you think about doing it this way? Go back and do it this way. And so you go back, you change some stuff, you rerun it. So you have, you're, you're constantly going back. And if your workflow takes more than 10 or so minutes to run, then it's worth your while to have some sort of reproducible build system to keep track of all that. So mm -hmm. you can run things and stay up to date really fast and really jump around this iterative process smoothly. Yes, yes. And like I mean, this has been a long time coming to have something that the R user doesn't have to know how to cryptically make a, a, a syntax for a make file. This will help help them wrap it in a data frame. Yeah. I hope so. And I hope the data frame interface is is helpful to people um, I certainly find it convenient to not have to write a text file, a configuration file, even though I understand what those configuration files mean. Right. So I, even even better if the user doesn't understand sort of how to how to write a make file, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other benefit I wanted to say is is it gives you reproducibility. There is a way to check that your results match the code. There mm -hmm. is a promise when you when you release something that these results were actually generated from the code that you provide. Right. Do you want to, there, there's got to be a way to prove it without having to rerun everything from start to finish and without having to do this forensic data analysis or forensic statistics as it's sometimes called. Yes, um, exactly. So, and with, with Drake, you can do it really fast. Yeah, and what in your choice of you know using the data frame is kind of like your your first class citizen for the user to interact with this, 
it's fitting in, whether you did this on purpose or not, very well with the new kind of tidyverse methodology of the data frame being the way we organize various things, whether it's variables in a data set or even metadata within that. But you're, you're in that same mindset that with R, you have so many ways you can interact with these. And now the user should be pretty familiar of how to work with those and that Drake shouldn't be a, a huge learning curve to utilize in their projects. So that's interesting design choice. I really hope so. Thanks. I haven't historically been sort of the, the most up to date and current with the tidyverse, but I am trying. And that was a design feature that, mm -hmm. that you know, where I tried to go along with that. Yep, yep, I think it's working well so far. And um, you touched on the point I wanted to mention next about the whole idea of analysis reproducibility. Mm -hmm. And by now, anybody familiar with R and the R community has seen some really big innovations in terms of using things like R Markdown to, narr to put the narrative of your, your analysis report with the actual analysis results and things like that over the last few years. R Notebooks has become another big motivation there. Just from your side of work looking at these technologies, what are do you think that we solved a lot of the biggest issues, or do you still think there are some pain points in this whole reproducible analysis workflow that a lot of us are trying to utilize in the best way? Just from your perspective, I am trying to address a glaring hole in the community buzz around reproducibility, especially as it centers around the tools that you mentioned. Yes. yes. So GitHub for tracking your code or at least some kind of version control gives you a history of your project that is amazing doesn't solve everything the R markdown and knitter based tools that you mentioned i think of them as being amazing tools for either very quick analyses or to thoroughly annotate the final results of a really big analysis if I'm doing something that takes a really long time to run or that has thousands of lines of code, you know, even with code externalization, even with the ability to cache code chunks in Knitter, for those of, of you who are familiar, I find that my own projects have gotten really cluttered if I try to use Knitter as my principal workflow manager from start to finish. I see, I see. So I like the modularity of having sort of my own workspace or my own package-based um, way of organizing things. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to break things up into pieces like that and sort of apply knitter at the very end. Mm. So it's interesting. It's kind of like, you know, the philosophy uh, that Hadley's been on record in terms of function or development perspective of not having functions that do too much at once. So like in your, maybe not a direct analogy, but you're breaking up pieces of your analysis into these chunks that may not be overly ambitious in each one, but you can put them all together, of course, with Drake as a way to tie that all in. And then maybe towards the end, you loop in some like R Markdown and Knitter to compile the results that you generated. So exactly. It sounds like that's what you're thinking then. Yep. Exactly, and that's an approach that I rely on this is a point of friction of with me that I'm that I'm about to talk about, but I recently I should say that if you're using Knitter to reproducibly track a project and you set cache equal to true in your code chunks, there are ways to tell Knitter to make different decisions about which chunks are rerun and which chunks are skipped. There's the auto dep flag, and if you set that Knitter will look for dependency chunks. And if one of those dependency chunks changes, the idea is that the current chunk should be rerun. There's the depends on option where you can tell Knitter which chunks depend on each other. And there is the cache.comments flag where you can tell Knitter to ignore changes to white space or comments. I'm really glad that functionality is there. At the same time, it's buried pretty deep in the documentation and it's disabled by default. And I still don't think these features are a complete solution. So for example, if I want more modularity than Knitter's code externalization gives me, and I create my own custom R script, and I use the source function to load it into one of my code chunks, even if auto depth equals true, changes in that R script don't trigger reruns to that code chunk. So I still think that Drake and Remake address a very big unmet need, 
for build systems that focus on being build systems, and that are made for large, very modular projects, where saving time is really important, for preserving modularity is really important, and where this reproducible tracking of code is at the forefront. One uh, little bit of a tangent here, but one um, new part of the R ecosystem you've been working on a little bit lately is a Shiny development. So you've been working on some stuff here at work um, with, with Shiny. I'm just curious, as I've learned Shiny, I feel like it's you have to have a different mindset to really use it effectively than the typical R workflow. But as someone who's just kind of diving into a new, what are some of your observations of creating a Shiny app from, from your perspective? So it's much easier to reach my audience, for sure. Yep. If I'm trying to make a point or I'm trying to make a program that's sort of easy for everyone to use, that's, I mean, that much has been really gratifying at work. Mm -hmm. um, the, so I'm a shiny novice and I'm still figuring out how, you know, what, what is the best way to organize my, my app and to quality control it, especially to quality control it. Yeah. Because... Yeah. I feel like I've I have a system down for packages now. I I test all the user side functionality and unit tests, save right. them in a sort of a test that friendly way. Yes. I check the code coverage with the cover package COVR. Yep. And I I look at the lines of code that are not covered in tests and I make enough tests to get the coverage up to 100% and I add more tests if it turns out that I missed functionality on the user side. Mm -hmm. And that kind of quality control is up and coming in Shiny. There, that, that sort of automated testing is under development right now. Right. But I'm, you know, in the meantime, it's, you know, it, it can be for, for my, my own, um, my own naive work, it can be, it can be a little, little cumbersome at times. Yeah. I try to offload as much as I can, I mean the actual computation inside an app into a custom package that I can test and quality control, you know, till you know, till I know it's going to work and then have a shiny interface on top of that that does as little as possible. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, in future episodes, I'm going to start to parse all the stuff that I learned at the Shiny DevCon in, in early 2016, but also earlier this year at our studio conf when, when I went to the Shiny uh, intermediate training session. Lots of info there, and I feel like there are ways that we can make Shiny development a little easier for people if we just kind of get them started the right way. But well, your point about offloading a lot of the heavy lifting to a separate package, if you're doing any kind of complex app that is going to be used kind of in a, in a more robust way or in a production type environment, you're saving yourself a lot of time if you can test that kind of functionality separately from the app itself. So I think this is something I'm going to impart as I talk about Shiny more in future episodes that the more you can either use existing packages for that heavy analysis lifting or create one on your own that you can unit test yourself with the more established workflows, making sure your coverage, your test has coverage and everything like that, you're gonna set yourself up a lot easier. And if you put everything in the Shiny app at once and you have to test all that back end stuff at the same time, it is quite painful. <laughs> right, it's the modularity that we're talking about. Yep. And I suppose yep. Shiny modules might be worth a discussion on this too. Yep, absolutely. But it's is, a, yep. mm -hmm. it, offloading into packages may be a more testable form of modularity at, at right. this stage. Right. You know, hopefully right. things will get easier in the future. Yeah, I'm keeping a close eye on the uh, Shiny test package that our studio has now started developing. So we're a lot of us are very interested, and I'm keeping logs of that GitHub issue on Tracker every day to see what the latest uh, takes on those. Um, so getting, taking a step back a little bit, obviously we've been talking about R a lot. This is the R podcast after all. But I'm always curious as I talk with, with newer users or, or people that I've met recently, What's your take on some of the other uh, platforms and data science that are being used a lot, like uh, Python or more recently Julia? Have you used those as much, or? So I haven't used Julia at all. I'm I'm keeping the possibility open, but I just haven't had an excuse to really dive into it. Right, right. And it's been, gosh, it must be over seven or so years since I've used Python seriously. Mm -hmm. 
I was at a time firmly in the Python camp. Now I am firmly in the R camp. Interesting. Not okay. ideologically though. It's okay. it's a matter of familiarity, which I think a lot of people in in you know maybe in your podcast and other podcasts I've 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 heard talk about. I like that Python is truly multi-purpose language that goes beyond data science, that goes beyond statistics. Mm -hmm. It may have less built-in statistical support mm -hmm. because there's, I mean, the, our community has sort of grabbed a lot of those people, but I like that it can do sort of other computing related tasks very easily. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like if the creators of R, I often think, had originally just gone for, for Python, were, were sort of, I don't know, content with a less flexible language than R is, then, I don't know, maybe we would have a Tower of Babel in, <laughs> in, the, in the data science world, yeah. rather yeah. than a few you know, separate languages that are getting better at talking to each other, but still aren't quite there yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know for the Python, the R communication feather has been an interesting... Uh, package uh, to pass the data back and forth but yeah there's still a lot of work to be done i think yeah that is exciting do you know about um so there is so there i've heard about feather i think i heard it on not so standard deviations actually yep. uh, a mention in a, in a discussion yep. that was that was really fascinating to to hear about mm -hmm. um and i'm i'm wondering if if you know see i haven't looked into this but i wonder if people working on on sort of apis between python and r um, and and sort of the state of the state of that world. I should I should really go look. Well, I did some poking around, and apparently, our studio has a package in development for that that same API type communication. I forgot what it's called. I'll put a link in the show notes when I look it up. But it's still early days. But it looks like there is some more developments on that side too. So, I mean, for me personally, yeah, the only use of Python I do somewhat regularly is for ironically the R podcast website which I am going to overhaul yet again in the near future for an totally R workflow but that's the only time I touch it otherwise uh, all my other projects are in R of course mm -hmm. so, but yeah and I wonder how much overlap there's going to be in the future because I mean the the blog down and package down packages in R are sort of trying to do similar things now sure which is what I'm going to be the website for the podcast I'm going to go to blog down uh, some thoughts about that later on as I get things more production ready. But it's, it's yeah, I mean, I think there is going to be some overlap there in various ways. And then more recently, the R Notebook feature is basically what, sort of like what the Jupyter Notebooks and the IPython Notebooks have been like. I think actually they're a little better than those because it has some additional features. But again, I've only begun exploring it. But but it's interesting that you went from Python to R. It's, it's interesting uh, transition there. Yep. Yeah. Do you think learning, having Python experience beforehand helped you learn R at all? Or mm. do you think it was kind of a wash? That's a good question. I think it, it brought along some experience that may have helped me climb the learning curve along with a bunch of bad habits. Oh, interesting. Like usual. Okay. okay. Um, you know, there's the usual things like adjusting to not indexing from zero, not using oh, as many for loops. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And as I've gotten more, a little bit into some of the object-oriented programming in R, I'm I've sort of you know coming from originally sort of a C plus plus and Python background, I, I sort of expected more of the object-oriented paradigm to be implemented in R, mm -hmm. and you know things like S3 and S4 classes. Yeah, they're they're more they're more flexible. I mean, in in C++, they they say that object-oriented programming is encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Hmm. Those are there and usually people only talk about sort of encapsulation. And that's that's sort of wrapping up your your you know, a bunch of objects and functions and wrapping them together in in a class. And having instances of those classes, the, those classes that can sort of do things on their own, mm -hmm. and you you have concrete objects that can do actions and can have you know member objects, you know, and and they sort of um, walk around and you you treat them as the objects they are instead of you know working on functions as your as you sort of the building block of your of your workflow. Yeah. Okay, interesting. And sort of this this isn't unique to R. I think um, last time I checked, JavaScript didn't have any sort of native polymorphism either. Hmm. Sort of you or or inheritance, I think. Um, 
that was sort of more limited than I expected it to be last time I tried JavaScript about three years ago. Okay. And there are some sort of, there is there is custom code that people use to get around that, but it's not built in, yeah. certainly. And so, yeah, what object-oriented programming means is different depending on, depending on the language you come from. And mm -hmm. I was always taught in, in college that it sort of means this set of things everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my venture in the programming early on got off to a bad start with my Java class, and my professor just didn't really dive into any of these concepts, and I was expected to just know it for homework assignments. And I wonder why the heck am I going to keep doing this? Well, thankfully, after that, I found better ways to learn it. But, but yeah, it's interesting. It's very kind of subjective sometimes what these languages are imparting on you. Yeah. So my first ever programming experience was also Java, and it ground my my gears for for similar reasons. <laughs> I was. Uh, there is, it's, I guess the thought is that you can jump into, it's object oriented in the traditional sense sure. and you get to, so you learn the paradigm and you get to jump into drawing things, animating things very quickly. Mm -hmm. But as a first language, there are so many moving parts that to learn it sort of all at once is, it can be overwhelming and can it be, and it can be frustrating and it sort of turned me off to programming for a while, honestly. Yeah. So it was, you know. It, would, it was not my first language of choice, and I, I have not, uh, by my own volition, gone into, gone into Java very much. Yep, I have not touched over a 10-foot pole after that <laughs> class. The only time I touch it now is through the packages that use our Java as a wrapper. That's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and luckily then, they, they take all those details for me. So. Right. Yep, yep. But I, I do um, want to touch on a point, you know, how when you're learning languages, computer languages like that, it can be frustrating at first. So if you had some advice for those that are new to R and they're thinking, what is going on here? I'm having a really tough time learning this. Do you have any advice for new R users in terms of how to get started effectively? Start with the tidyverse. Start with R Studio. Follow the people who work for our studio. That is the Garden of Eden of R. Everything is nice there, and things play nicely with each other, and frolic in pastures, and have fun times. This will be it's, a sound bite great. for future episodes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's so true. This was not around when I first learned this. None of this was. My editor of choice back then, I don't even know, I don't even know if the Notepad++ to R plugin was around back then. But I know I used either that or just I used Vim from the command line to write the scripts and send it to R in batch mode or something. This is not nearly what we have now. So those of you that are new to this, you should be thankful for what you have because it was not like this, you know, 12, 15, 13 years ago. <laughs> Very much agreed. And when I was first learning R, the, a bunch of this stuff was was in development for sure. It's It's definitely come a long way. Yep, it certainly has, and it's going going in many directions now in the future for, for our benefit, definitely. So, Will, it's been awesome to talk with you, and um, if people want to follow up what your latest developments are or what you're up to, what would be the best way they could contact you and, and follow your exploits? So my personal website is will-landau.com. That's W-I-L-L hyphen L-A-N-D-A-U dot com. And my GitHub username is W Landau. Awesome. And uh, Drake is on CRAN right now, correct? It is on CRAN. Awesome. It's in version 2.0.0. Awesome. And I am coming out with a new minor release fairly soon. And it's got some improvements to the documentation. And it adds another form of parallel computing to the arsenal that is already there. So currently it has two forms of parallel computing. And I'm adding a third that's sort of for platform independence's sake. Very cool. Yep, we'll have all the links in the show notes if people want to try this out and get to know the, the framework a little bit. But um, thanks so much, Will, for joining me. And um, obviously, we'll be talking again very soon because we, we work together. But um, yeah, you're welcome back on the show anytime. Thanks, Eric. This is a lot of fun. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Will. And everyone, we will be right back. Okay, I want to thank Will again for taking the time to talk to me. And um, I hope you got, you know, through that interview, you could see that, yeah, he's got a lot of awesome ideas. He has excellent strengths in, in this space in terms of computation, especially with the, you know, looking at graphical processing and other high performance computing concepts. But just the work that he has done with Drake, I think, can really help a lot of people with their analysis pipelines and making sure that you don't 
have to rerun things when you don't have to, but doing it in a very intelligent way. So I definitely invite you to go to the, um, the rpodcast.org site and click on the show notes for episode 22 for all the links that we have discussed during the talk. Um, but again, thanks, Will. And I'm sure that we'll be talking again, whether it's on the podcast or not about R, because we, we tend to do that. So, all right, with our interview done, let's go ahead and dive into the R Community Roundup. Okay, so I got a pretty uh, fancy uh, batch of Roundup here, and um, I think I mentioned it a couple times before, but I'll just repeat it again. Um, as far as where I get you know, my inspiration for which uh, stories to talk about, um, I've always been a big fan of the R Blogger site, and then now more recently, the um, R Weekly site, which I'm, I'm proud to be uh, starting to become a contributor for. And a couple other, you know, newer sources, at least for me, because I'm a bit of an old timer. I am now using the uh, RStats hashtag on Twitter, which you'll be hearing about again shortly to kind of scrape some ideas there. And then also the uh, RStats uh, subreddit on reddit.com has become an interesting source as well. So anyway, those are the, the places I usually go to. So the first up on our, our community roundup, um, we recently there was the uh, second uh, sad sad Saturday. Well, easy for me to say. Let me try that again. So first up in our community roundup, we got uh, the videos and recordings from the recent Saturday conference. That's spelled S A T R D A Y, of course. That happened in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. The uh, videos are now available. So I'll have a link in the show notes to the online program where you can get links to all of the talks that were that took place at the conference. So of course, since I couldn't attend, that's always great when conferences are able to release those. So you did. There are some excellent keynote talks from uh, Jenny Bryan, who of course I mentioned at the top, and uh, Julia Silge um, about you know text mining with R, which is an area that I'm definitely interested in maybe pursuing down the road. So it's interesting to see how the tidyverse uh, philosophy ha- um, is able to help um, that type of analysis. Lots of other, you know, user talks and maybe I'm not sure the lightning talks or not, but there there's a lot of good selections there. Um, a p- particular one that got my attention was um, a talk called G- Who Goes There? Profiling Street by Street Audience with Telco Data. Um, this was given by, uh, I believe, Kyle Huerta. Sorry if I'm butchering your name on that. My pronunciation skills are never 100%. Um, but it was um, a fascinating talk that he gave and a, and a great showcase of how they are using uh, telecom data to really gain insights on their customers that he even mentions at the top of the talk that the telco companies really have no idea who's using their services in terms of the, the makeup of them, what are their, you know, their characteristics, things like that. And he's really, he really did a nice entertaining talk. He even threw an analysis of hipsters in a very funny way. So you'll definitely have to check that one out. It's highly recommended. So looks like they had a great turnout. Everything went, sounds like very well. Um, So it's great to see these uh, more community type conferences uh, really taking off. And I'm glad that the the R Consortium has put some funding behind these. I think it's an awesome initiative. And the next time that one of these happens in, in my neck of the woods, I certainly want to try and attend one of these in the future. So next up, I want to highlight um, an idea that comes with kind of continuing the theme that we discussed last time, or at least a couple episodes ago, about how CRAN has now hit 10,000 packages, which again is an awesome milestone. But of course, it opens a discussion of how do users really discover these? You know, which, how do they find the packages that are really helpful for a given analysis need, or maybe finding ways to process data sets? You know, and any type of area. So one method that's been in existence for a, quite a while, um, officially, so to speak, has been what we call the uh, R uh, task views or the CRAN task views. 
So this is a set of roughly 20 or so categories of packages in which there is one person that curates all the packages that kind of help a, a given area. So for example, I, I believe uh, Dirk Edebuto, of course, was a guest on our recent episode. He maintains the CRAN task view on high performance computing. There's many other uh, task views on there as well. Um, one of the newer ones is dealing with web APIs. That's a really interesting one too. So of course you can get to that from the R project site directly, um, from the CRAN sites directly, so to speak. But as like many things on, the, on those sites, I'll, I'll admit the interface is a bit, um, how, how do I say it delicately, a bit uh, terse or basic. You know, it was made many years ago and it, I guess if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But at the same time, we tend to have newer ways of interacting with content online. Which, of course, if you're an R user, that gets to the tool that I've become very um, I'm passionate about using, the Shiny. Well, it turns out that there has been uh, an effort in the community to actually make a Shiny app that can basically wrap the, the idea of finding these packages in a, in a CRAN task view. So that there is a, a Shiny app called Task Viewer. That's T-A-S-K-V i-e-w-r and this is a really interesting uh, application so this uh, task viewer app was created by Mikhail Popov and again I hope I'm pronouncing that somewhat close um, but he's thrown this on the uh, shinyapps.io uh, service provided by our studio and we'll have a link to that in the show notes but what this app does in a nutshell is it gives you a nice kind of data table layout via of course the DT widget and you can filter the packages by their task view and also be able to show the description as an option and it gives a view of the the title of the package the license is under but it's just basically a way to interact with the content on these task viewers in a, in a more web friendly way i would say so i i saw this and i immediately bookmarked it because again it's a great way to keep tabs on what these um task viewers um, what are on these uh, task viewer views easy for me to say um, he is updating the content of this i believe on a regular basis and so when i first saw the app i, I again i was really impressed by it it does one thing obviously very well but i did notice there might be a way that we can enhance the ui a little bit so and, and of course it is a shiny application so when you have one of these uh, select inputs you of course have the way of clicking inside the input itself with your mouse and then selecting new ones and then in order to get rid of some let's say you change your mind you often have to put your cursor in the text box click inside and hit like a delete key or a backspace to get rid of it well, there's a little known feature in Shiny for these inputs when you use something called the select ties input. This is basically uh, a, a more, and it's another input that lets you select things kind of in a, a clicky manner, but it uses a JavaScript library on the back end, uh, I believe called select ties, if I'm not mistaken. And of course, you as the end user don't really have to care about that as much. But if you, are, if you are willing to dive into some of the configurations that that plugin gives you, there is a little plugin that will let you put basically little X's next to each item in that select input, which means that the user can simply click those X's to, close, get, to get rid of it, just like how you would close any window on your ordinary uh, computer desktop. So I've been doing that with some apps at work, so I figured, well, why not? Let's just see if, if uh, Mikhail will be receptive to throwing that into the app itself. So uh, like everything that's been shared in the community these days, it was on GitHub, thank, thank goodness. And I could just simply do a quick clone and, and put that, change that input to a selectize input and then submit the PR and then Mikhail uh, merge it in. And I was uh, very happy that he liked the feature. So that's my very, very little contribution to this app. Um, I think he's done an awesome job. So if you're ever wanting a, a more uh, friendly interface to look at these task views besides the, uh, the default interface, uh, definitely check out this app. We, we'll, we again have the links in the, in the show notes for this episode. 
The next story I want to talk about got a lot of traction on the uh, on the Twitter sphere, if you will. Um, uh, re- not so much a newcomer to R, I believe, but she has um, just started a blog of her own. I'm gonna. I know I'm gonna get this name wrong. Uh, Mayo Mayoli uh, Salmon. Um, the first name I know I did not get right. I apologize in advance. Um, but she's done some awesome posts recently and, and tweets on on Twitter. But she just did an analysis where she wanted to look at. She called it the faces of the R stats Twitter. Um, so this. And I'll put a link to the um, our, the blog post in the show notes. So basically, to summarize, she got this idea from another tweet that presented basically a collage of Twitter pics of their colleagues. And she thought, well, maybe if he he did it using, I believe, R and Python. And of course, she wanted to do this in R only, but also kind of make a collage of profile pics of the users that are contributing to, like, say, the R stats hashtag. So of course I'm looking at this and I really like the style of the analysis, very cleanly written. And then of course, like many people, we go to the collage itself. And of course, as any kind of geek would want to do, I want to see if my uh, profile pic from the R Podcast Twitter handle, which is the R Cast, if you if you haven't seen it yet. Of course, I'm searching for it. I want to say, oh man, where do I show up on the list? Because I use the R Stats hashtag whenever I post an episode, right? But then I realized something. I look more closely at the code and she is trying to determine these users by basically scraping for those that put the actual hashtag R stats in their actual uh, Twitter profile description. Well, as I looked at it more closely, I realized when I first set up this Twitter handle, I did not put that hashtag in. <laughs> Well, needless to say, I have it in now. Um, but it was, uh, anyway, it was just one of those reminders of how much of a novice I am to some of this uh, social media stuff. <laughs> I'm trying to get better, but when you're, when you're a bit older like me, it's hard to really get, get into this sometimes. But anyway, um, I love the analysis. She did an awesome job with it. And of course, like I said, I have a link in the show notes. So uh, this, this got a lot of uh, praise on, on the Twitter feeds. And then um, another um, R user who I actually have met in person back at the Shiny DevCon, Andrew Clark, who you may know that has created a, a site called My Tiny Shinies and has done some really awesome dashboards of various either sports metrics or other kind of web type data. Well, he put a post on his own blog that kind of extended the code a bit to view his followers in a collage as well. So. Again, really interesting analysis. And the other thing it really taught me is that if you want to interact with you know, the Twitter API these days, I always, I always have bookmarked a lot of posts that have been using the um, package called Twitter with a capital R at the end. Apparently, there's been a bit of a shift that, um, that, uh, that's been uh, talked about by Maylee. May again, sorry, butchering your name again. Um, she mentions that it sounds like that package maintainer is passing it on and t- passing the torch, so to speak, to another um, package author of, a, of another um, Twitter API package called RTweet. So that's the first time I heard of it. Again, being a novice I am to these things. So I immediately downloaded that. And sure enough, I was able to replicate all our code because, of course, it's in R Markdown. So easy to copy that in. And so it's given me some ideas, maybe some potentially fun analyses to mine the uh, Twitter data, which has become a subject of a lot of analyses recently in the, in the R community. So again, really good articles. I have links to both uh, Mela's and um, Andrew's in the show notes. The last uh, item I want to talk about is actually a post from the RStats subreddit, which I think it's starting to get a little more attention, but I'm hoping that we get some more contributors there. It was a post about basically upgrading your data management skills. So this was inspired by another Reddit post, but I'll, I'll let you uh, click the link in the show notes if you want to look at the full thing. But it does have some pretty interesting tips from other users on how you deal with what I'll call messy merges. Maybe that the IDs should be the same, but there is some minor differences or you know, how to watch out for when you have to merge with dates in mind or other various situations. But it 
kind of talks about the overall thought process and how to kind of level up your skills with what can be a very messy part of the analysis. And as somebody who's dealt with some messy data in the past, especially in the space of uh, biomarker data, getting it from, say, some vendors where it was uh, not quite as uh, rigorously um, collected, or I should say uh, quantified as I would like in terms of formats, but but it helps, you know, makes you look into these tools to make the data processing easier. And I think today's uh, community of R, um, today's uh, packages in R, have a lot easier ways of dealing with these messy issues than when I first started using it. So, so anyway, some good tips there. So again, definitely check out that link in the show notes if you're interested. So I will mention that if you want me to, if you want to highlight some stories that you'd like me to talk about on the show, definitely uh, contact the show. Um, We'll talk about the ways of doing that shortly because it is now time for our listener feedback. Message for you, son. All right. So first up in the listener feedback today. I want to give a shout out to a, a user that just discovered the R podcast. His name is Lars Showbits. Again, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right. He goes by the handle Larns, C-E-L-A-R-N-S-C-E. Again, I don't know how to pronounce those sometimes. But uh, he sent a little tweet recently saying, Highlight of the weekend, discovery of the R podcast by the R cast. Hashtag our stats, hashtag so excited. So again, Lars, I'm really glad you discovered the show and I hope you enjoy listening. Um, again, as I kind of mentioned somewhat in, in humor, the back catalog, the early episodes are a bit rough to get through, but hopefully the later ones are, are more, uh, more entertaining and more informative. Um, someone in parallel to that was a, a discussion that I uh, chimed in with towards the end where um, uh, Jason Becker, who goes by at Jason Becker. Um, he was asking uh, Bob Rudis, who, um, again, I give you, you probably heard of him. He's been a very prominent Aura blogger on his site, and he also gave a recent talk at our Studio Conf that got a lot of praise, which I was able to view the recording of finally. But anyway, um, Jason was asking if Bob would start his podcast again because they, he was doing a podcast with another co host, something I believe called Our World News. But it sounds like Bob's probably not going to be starting that again anytime soon. But then uh, there was a discussion about, man, there are really no podcasts out there about R. So finally, uh, Jonathan uh, gave me a shout out. Jonathan Carroll, who goes by the handle Carroll underscore Jono, or how you want to say that, John. Um, he just gave me a shout out and said that pro- I probably need better advertising, which he is he is right. I do. I'm still not the best at this. But um I, I did uh, mention kind of in the thread, you know, what ideas do you have? And he definitely gave some good advice about making sure I'm on the R Bloggers feed and at R Weekly, which I think in the last few episodes I have gotten on the R Weekly section for podcasts, but I'll make sure that continues when these episodes go out. And then I believe there's some something that's happened with the R Bloggers feed, so I need to get in touch with Tal Galili on maybe getting that back up. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely working to get the word out. So if you like the show, I definitely could use your help with that too. If you want to retweet or just send a rating on iTunes, anything like that would be very welcome. And I am definitely looking at ways of expanding content, obviously, and, and keeping the show going, as they say. So again, just nice to always to get new listeners out there. So a feedback that came to the uh, our po- the our podcast email, which is drcast at gmail uh, came from Jared Nolo- Knowles. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that right, Jared. Um, he wrote, "Hi, Eric. I wanted to email you to say thank you for the our podcast. One of my goals for 2017 is to be more intentional about thanking people who make things that make my life better, and I really enjoy your show." You clearly have a great passion for R and Shiny, especially, as I have, and I have learned a lot from your interviews with the great guests you have had on the show. I am grateful for the effort you have made to, hot, made to highlight news in the R community and to shine a spotlight on some of the people who work behind the scenes or their screens to make R better. I think the audio quality has been really great, too. Not sure what others are hearing. 
You are doing a great job and I've learned a lot. Keep up the great work. That's Jared. So Jared, thank you so much. That really uh, was a great pick me up as well. And um, I knew Jared's name was familiar because I had recently, um, I think it was late last year, he had done what he called the data science live stream on YouTube. He did a set of about 12 episodes and I really enjoyed it because you rarely see somebody actually show the actual process of conducting their analysis. Let's face it, in today's, in today's world, we're often looking at people's uh, you know, GitHub profiles for their projects. And of course, you're seeing these commits as they happen, but you don't really see the thought process and how they get to certain steps. So I think Jared was an a, a awesome pioneer in this sense to really show how he went about doing like exploratory data analyses, you know, data aggregation, data cleaning, things like that. So, so Jared, I, I, I wrote back to him, obviously thanked him for the kind feedback. And, you know, what we will be doing in terms of the podcast in, in the coming not so distant future is, I think you've heard me mention before that I'm really getting the itch to um, start contributing back to the R community via either some R packages or maybe some shiny apps or some other, you know, type of analysis, if you will. So as I get into the concept of package development again, I'm, I'm gonna um, ask Jared to come on the show to give his perspectives on his uh, package development and he uh, kindly agreed to it. So hopefully in a couple months we'll get that worked out. But um, if you haven't checked out uh, Jared's uh, data science live stream, I definitely would invite you to check that out and we'll put that link in the show notes as well. So yeah, in terms of providing feedback to the show, you have multiple ways of doing that. You could go to the podcast site at r-podcast.org, go ahead and click the contact link at the top, and then you'll get a simple contact form to help uh, provide me a, a direct message to the show. And you can always email me at the, the podcast email address of drcast at gmail.com. And of course, if you wanna give a message on Twitter, my handle is at the rcast. So with the feedback done, let's round up the show with some package picks. Alright, so we got a couple package picks today. Um, the first one is something that kind of may have flown under the radar for some of you, but I discovered it, I believe, via the uh, Cranberries uh, post that is uh, Dirk's uh, service to kind of send daily updates on new R packages or updated R packages on Cran. And so the package I want to highlight is called Reminder. That's spelled with Remind in lowercase with a capital R at the end. This is meant to provide in-code text reminders to aid your code development. The author of this is Bert Gunter, and we'll put a link to obviously the package on Cram page and in the show notes. But at a high level, here's how the package works and some of the inspiration that I believe uh, motivated the package. So of course, as we're working on an analysis, maybe a shiny app or some other you know, type of R script, we're gonna think of things that we need to maybe keep track of in the future. And of course, one of the easiest ways of doing that when you're in the flow, so to speak, of developing your code is to put comments in your, your code script. And of course, if you have a GitHub you know, repository that you're using, you probably were gonna put an issue there as well. But sometimes you just don't wanna break that flow of you know, putting that down in the scripts and then you'll go back to it later. But of course, if you have a lot of comments in your script, it may be hard to keep track of what you, where you put that little nugget to follow up on. So what, he, what uh, Bert has done with this reminder package is that if you put a comment with a special set of delimiter uh, symbols um, surrounding it, I believe the default is two of the, uh, the angle brackets. Um, if you put your, your sentence or your reminder, if you will, between those uh, delimiters somewhere, say in your function code or even in just a general R script, you can then 
load the reminder package using typical library call and then there is a function called remind where you feed into it um, I believe the name of the function that you put that reminder in. I think it also supports um, the name of the script as well, although I'd have to double check that. Um, but basically when you run that, you'll now get some output in the console that actually scrapes all the comments in that script and then it finds those that had those special delimiters and it will output it for you in a very clean way in, in, the, in the R console. So where I see um, advantages of this is that I've had to develop some extremely complex uh, Shiny apps recently. I've tried to break them up into modules, but even some of the modules just have a lot going on inside. And I'll think of something either through debugging or maybe a user comes up to me and says, hey, could you build this in or something like that? And then I quickly put a comment in a, at the appropriate section and be like, oh, I got a, like a to-do or something, you know, do this or whatever. But, of course, let's say a week goes by, I get pulled into a different project, and I work on a different module, and of course I completely forget. So I think using this package might be a good way for me to intersperse these throughout my different uh, shiny you know, functions or modules and then be able to quickly scrape through those and be able to figure out what did I, what did I remind myself to do that I did not put, say, on the GitHub tracker yet or anything like that. So. I really um, think it does, it does this very well. So um, thanks to Bert for creating that package. The next one I want to highlight is more on the visual and interactive side. Um, this came in via um, a conversation I was having with uh, Jonathan City, um, who has authored the uh, GG Edit package that I believe we mentioned in one of the previous episodes that was um, rounding up the RStudio Conf presentations. So he's been, he's been hard at work on other packages as well. And actually, um, John's been asking me for feedback on the updates he made, the GG Edit, in which you can incorporate that via the Shiny module paradigm within any kind of app that's within any kind of Shiny app, which to me opens the floodgates, if you will, of not only using GG Edit as an add-in within our studio as you're making your GG plot and quickly want to tweak the interface of it but if i can plug this into a shiny app so that the user if they don't like what i thought was reasonable and how the plot's represented they can in theory just click a button to bring up the the gg edit interface change the font sizes change the theme of the plot do all sorts of cosmetic tweaks and then they'll be able to um, have a plot that they like at the end without me having to try and program around how many different ways I could do that plot and give them select inputs or sliders or whatever else to tweak the element. So John's done all that hard work for us. So I'm, I'm working on incorporating that in some of my apps right now. And John, I'll be uh, in touch with you if I find any issues along the way, but I think you've set it up quite nicely. So anyway, with that little tangent done, he's been working on some additional packages and one that he gave me a heads up on is called Fluid Spine. That's lowercase fluid with a capital S for spine. We'll have a link to this, of course. Uh, we'll have a link to the GitHub repo in the show notes. But what this is, is that he's wrapped an HTML widget, again, using kind of the HTML widgets paradigm, that basically lets you, the, lets you supply in a data frame that will be kind of plotted in terms of points, say like a scatter plot. So maybe you have an X and a Y column or whatever else you wanna call those two columns. And then it will bring up an interface that plots those points, again, like a scatter plot. But then you, the user, can choose how to actually connect those points together using various uh, interpolation methods in a very friendly HTML type widget. And not only that, you can also move the points around, you could delete points, and best of all, he's made it so that, of course, you can use this in any typical R session and play with it. But if you do incorporate it into a Shiny app, you'll get kind of the callbacks of what the user did to interact with that. And you can use that to do some additional investigations or additional processing. So it's, 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 it's very slick to look at because it also even animates the points in terms of the, the transition from points as kind of like a connect the dots type framework. It's uh, actually kind of fun to look at if you want just something entertaining to look at for a few minutes, but I'm sure 
I'm going to be able to find some interesting use cases for this. Um, it just um, was an interesting, interesting application. And once again, HTML widgets that tie together a JavaScript library that me as an R user primarily would probably never have heard of. And even if I did, I wouldn't have any clue of how to use it from R directly. So Jonathan's doing some really awesome work, and um, I definitely commend you for doing that. So. Again, we'll have a link to Fluid Spine as well as Reminder in, in the show notes. So yeah, I think with that, we're going to put a bow and a wrap on this episode. So as I mentioned uh, previously, if you like what you hear, um, you definitely want to subscribe to us. Um, uh, the podcast feed is on SoundCloud, so you can get the episodes directly. Um, the last time I checked, I am, I am finally on the Pocket Cast app for Android. We are, of course, on iTunes as well. So just search for the R podcast there. And then, of course, for RSS feeds on the site directly, head to r-podcast.org. You'll see the links on the sidebar for uh, subscribe options. I also have, of course, the contact form if you want to get in touch with us. But that's where I'm going to put all the links to the show notes, um, all the, the links of the show notes, I should say. And um, it also has a way for you to comment on those posts directly. So if you want to get in touch that way, that's a very easy way as well. And then one more admin update before we go. I am on an adventure, if you will, of converting the R podcast site from using my current uh, static site generator of uh, Nicola to using Blogdown so that I could almost, well, not quite 100%, but I would say more than 90% of my workflow for publishing content of the podcast site could be done entirely in R itself. So that's just, let's face it, that's really cool. Um, So I'm on the right track. I've got kind of the skeleton or the the index page of the site basically replicated. Um, I've had to do some uh, modifications of a theme I'm using in Hugo, but I finally figured it out of where I needed to do those things. And now really the next step is to figure out if I need to introduce backward compatibility with the site's RSS feeds or not. Um, I'm on the fence of that. Of course, it's really easy if you just start from scratch with something new. But when you have something that you're already modifying, you always have to find the balance there. But um, let's put it this way. When that is finally done, I think the site's going to look even better. And best of all, I'm going to be able to tell you all about that journey because... I think Blogdown, just like R Markdown itself, is going to enable more people in the R community to really uh, share their insights, share their ideas, and um, communicate that very easily in an online presence. So, okay, I think that's going to be a good end to the show. So, until next time. End of line.